I would like to share my story, how I became a cardiologist. And uh, the inspiration for me to become an interventional cardiologist stems from my own personal experience in the family. My grandfather, who I have to take, drive myself into the nearest emergency room when he had a heart attack. And he was frothing from the mouth. So when a heart attack happens, the heart kind of fails completely. Fluid builds up in the lung and they froth. So based on this personal experience, uh, I got inspired, and right around that time, the cardiology, the face of cardiology was changing, as you can see, and as I walk you through the slides today. In the last 100 years, cardiovascular disease has remained the number one cause of death, and that includes like heart attacks, strokes, diseases with hypertension-related, heart failure, and all that. And this, despite 60% reduction in age-adjusted mortality uh, because of the advances that we had, despite the 60% reduction in age-adjusted mortality, cardiovascular disease continues to be the number one cause of death. So what, what are these cardiovascular diseases include? If you, have, if you take the heart, the heart pump can fail, and that's called congestive heart failure and uh, valves inside the heart, they can fail, valvular heart disease. Coronary artery disease, the number one cause for death. And why we call the coronary artery disease is the arteries of the heart sit on the top of the heart as if it is a crown, and we call them coronary artery disease. And uh, the next one is arrhythmia, rhythm disturbances of the heart. And of course, the stroke also, the brain attack. Brain stroke also is included in the cardiovascular disease when we count about all these numbers. So we all know Sir William Harvey was credited with description of cardiovascular disease. Um, I know how the heart pumps and how the blood flows into the chambers, through the valves, into the arteries, and takes into the uh, you know, tissues of the body. But right in 16th century, we have a depiction uh, of aortic valve, the valve that sits between the heart and the body. And uh, you can see here, the valve was clearly described by Leonardo da Vinci, uh, you know, how it looks, and it conforms to the current idea and the reality, actually. But not until about 100 years ago, in 1913, any of these valve problems was treated with nothing. But then came the surgery where a Frenchman, um, you know, <clears throat> was able to repair this valve by doing an open heart surgery. And after that, multiple iterations have happened. Heart-lung machines have come around. Uh, and again, in 1985, further advancement happened. Through the catheter, through the groin, uh, you would go in and with the balloon, you open uh, this you know, valve that is stiffening up and not opening properly, uh, we call them as balloon valvuloplasty. Uh, this was done by Dr. Alain Crebier in France, and again in 2002, he was the first person to do a total valve replacement all through the groin, no open heart surgery. And we do the transcatheter valve replacements on a, any given day basis right now. Imagine the patient walks in, gets the valve replacement, goes home the next day. And the next one is the heart attacks. Like, everybody knows about a heart attack. I'm sure one of your family members had a heart attack and you heard about it. Uh, just take uh, the example of uh, President Dwight Eisenhower, who was the 34th president of America. In 1955, he had a heart attack. But it was not recognized until about 12 hours later. Um, and uh, even though there was an EKG available, um, he was diagnosed about 12 hours later. He was put under bed rest. He was given morphine, which is a narcotic, which basically takes care of the pain and, and you know, anxiolytic kind of a thing. And nitroglycerin was available. Nitroglycerin is a medicine that is given for more than a century now. <clears throat> it reduces the amount of blood that's coming into the heart and offloads the heart pump. So that's all was given. And uh, for his care, Dr. Paul Dudley White was summoned from Mass General to Washington, D.C. to take care of him, and he was able to survive that episode. And that's all was done at that time. <clears throat> so, but 
what are the advances that has happened? Multiple advances. Like, say, if you take about a century ago, as I mentioned, bed rest, narcotics, morphine, and nitroglycerin. And in 1950s came external defibrillation. You all know about a defibrillator now. But these are the external devices. People with heart attacks, about 30% of the people were dying suddenly because of a dangerous heart rhythm that happens in the bottom chambers of the heart called ventricular fibrillation. So you, you, the paddles are put on the chest and you shock them. And in the 1960s, the concept of coronary care units came in. That has reduced the mortality of acute heart attack by 50%. What it is is, uh, it's a confined space. The nursing station is very close to the uh, patient's bed. They're being monitored closely. And uh, the nurses were trained to do, to do resuscitation at that time, other than doctors. And that has a tremendous impact on the care that was uh, delivered. And later on, a lot of medications came about. Right around that time in the 1960s, the first open heart surgery was done, wherein the surgeon would take a vein from the leg, there's a blockage in the artery, and you anastomose that to the aorta and bypass that to a normal heart vessel, heart, you know, under blood vessels, and you anastomose there. <clears throat> and uh, further medications were like beta blockers, and clot busters came in. Uh, 1990s statins came in. Most of you might have heard about Lipitor and things like that. So they have increased. Uh, our ability to cure these patients. As far as the catheter-based therapies are concerned, other than the surgeries, uh, multiple techniques came in, catheters. How do you reach the heart, first of all? People were going in from the, in the brachium, brachial artery, in the radial artery, in the femoral artery, in the groin. Um, Dr. Sohn's at Cleveland Clinic was first credited for the cardiac catheterization in the, in the humans. But as you can see here, different catheters, we reach into the heart, and open up the blockage with the balloon. And later on, the stents came in, the fine metal alloys, like uh, the coil kind of things. You deliver them, leaving the artery open and come out. And Andreas Grunzig is a, is a German radiologist. He was the first, in 1977, did use the balloon angioplasty in a human and who survived. Not only these, like multiple other advances came in. If a patient with a heart attack, nowadays we wheel them into the cath lab, do an angiogram, do an angioplasty, put a stent in. What if that doesn't work and the heart pump is still failing? Then came intraiotic balloon pump. The balloon pump wherein we use helium to do inflations, with, which is timed to each cardiac cycle, and it offloads the pressure on the heart, healing the heart while we are doing resuscitative measures. Further iterations happen. Now we do use uh, Impala, which is a pictel catheter, basically. It's a miniaturized. Uh, it sits in the heart. It offloads again the pump while the heart is having a heart attack. You revascularize, put stents in. Uh, but in the meanwhile, you're offloading the heart pump. And that's the Impala. We use it all the time nowadays. Say what these patients don't recover in three, four days. And uh, they might need a heart transplant. But in the meantime, you need some support. And further advancements, left ventricular assist devices came in. Um, there's a cup kind of a thing. Everything sits inside the chest. It's in the apex of the heart. There's a tube that's anastomosed to the aorta. And that can stay in for years and has done wonders for people who have advanced heart failures as a destination while they're waiting for a transplant. Further miniaturization of this technology is going to happen with the drive line now with uh, you know, external uh, battery pack and all, everything is supposed to go inside the chest. Very soon we'll be hearing that. So what are these, why, why do we get heart attack and what we can do? In 1948, uh, <clears throat> National Heart Lung Blood Institute has funded this study, famous longitudinal population-based study, study called Framingham Heart Study. It's based out of Framingham, Massachusetts. It's a town wherein the people were enrolled and watched for what they have and then monitored. And then see they're having heart attacks and strokes. What risk factors do they have? That's how we come to know what these risk factors are. And the first study, uh, first literature that came out of the study was in 1961, was published in Annals of Internal Medicine. 
that is where we know now that uh, advancing age is a risk factor, being a male over a female is a risk factor, having high blood pressure is a risk factor, somebody is a smoker is a risk factor, somebody is a diabetic is a risk factor. Uh, so what we call these as coronary risk factors. Now, is it everything related to risk factors? Like, can we completely prevent this heart attack by doing it, everything right? Probably not, because if you look at it, about 30% of these people in Framingham Heart Study uh, did not have traditional risk factors other than what they are, you know, how old they are and things like that. So there must be something genetic to it. If you look at one of these studies that was done, uh, they did the cardiac CT scans. Coronary arteries were scanned in mummies of all, uh, you know, from, from Egypt, from every, every part of the world they screened. And about 3,500 years ago, there was this Egyptian princess who apparently died in the early 40s, had a significant atherosclerosis when she died. This lends credence to the, not only that, not only that particular princess, but more than 50% of these mummies who were studied had atherosclerosis, the plaque buildup in the arteries. So that lends to the, you know, it, because everybody thinks that it's a modern disease, it's a lifestyle disease. But there is a small fraction of it which is not related to lifestyle disease. And that lends, to the, you know, the, the, the credence to the belief that genetics do play a role in this disease process. Uh, not only that, in the emerging, in the next decade or two, you'll be hearing much more things coming out in the diagnostic uh, arena, especially we have heard about artificial intelligence. We'll be seeing tremendous amount of AI being used in our diagnostic tools so that we can detect these conditions way ahead so that you could attack them and get very good results. We'll be hearing a lot about gene modification therapy because it's a genetic disease. There's a genetic role in it. You'll be able to f figure out who are predisposed to it, modify the genes by special techniques that we already have in the market. You'll be utilizing more in the market. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot about regenerative medicine, uh, precision medicine. So to get awakened today, what can we do as a human at this point I would borrow this infogram from American Heart Association, which talks about seven steps to heart healthy, uh, to a healthy heart. One is diet. Two is increasing your physical activity, getting at least 150 minutes of aerobic activity every week, which is moderate, like you know, brisk walking, running. Or if it is intense exercise, 75 minutes in a week. Number three, is controlling your sugars. Blood sugars have to be controlled. Uh, controlling your blood pressure. Controlling your, uh, making sure you have ideal body weight with a body mass index of uh, less than 25. Be smoke free and control your cholesterol. So these are the main seven steps that we can do. Coming to the diet, we hear a whole lot of uh, information about diet, but basic bottom line is Go for uh, whole grains, lean meat, uh, avoid adding too much sugar, too much salt. And these, uh, you know, pretty much we heard of a speaker today talking about the food chain and the problems that we have. My patients always ask me, what can we do, doc? So my mantra is moderation. Moderation in the diet. Whatever you eat, even if you like a cheesecake, eat a little bit, but control the portion. Portion control. So moderation is the mantra. Thank you all.